Burnout in physicians and other healthcare professionals is a huge problem. But I think really to understand the problem, we have to learn about people's stories. So I want to share with you my story today. This is my family. Yes, there's a lot of us. I'm one of seven children, West African Ghanaian immigrants. I'm the youngest on the bottom left there in the bright red sweater. And I wanted to follow my older siblings' footsteps, go off to college, potentially get a master's degree or professional degree, and be successful. And really, ultimately, I just wanted my parents to be proud of me. So of course, I went on a journey, as mentioned before, to multiple institutions around the country. And I wound up here, not just on this stage at the TEDx Salon, but here in Wilmington, Delaware, at Nemours Children's Health, where I'm a pediatric orthopedic surgeon. The most favorite part for me of my job is the ability and opportunity to connect and bond with my patients. I feel like the ties that bind us together as human beings are so powerful. But after I started my career as a surgeon, I quickly realized there's actually a lot of things that surgeons and physicians have to do that don't really help them do their jobs at all. We work in a highly regulatory environment. We have to deal with issues like HIPAA, compliance, legal, privacy, security. We also have to deal with ever-increasing patient volumes. Sometimes when I'm seeing patients, it feels like it's a never-ending conveyor belt of messages, images I have to look at, MRIs I have to interpret, patients I have to call back. And all of these things with this excess volume just diminishes the ability to connect and bond with my patients. Money is a huge issue. As a surgeon, I have to be productive. I have to do a certain number of cases. I have to see a certain number of patients. And all of these things influence my ability to take care of patients. Last but not least, there are a lot of non-clinical administrative folks that work in our hospital that make a lot of rules, policies, and initiatives that ultimately not only affect my job, but sometimes they interfere with my ability to take care of patients. When I was early on in my career as a surgeon, I had certain expectations of what my life would be like. But then I quickly realized that my reality was a lot different than my expectations, and that was affecting me. Here's a picture of an x-ray of a kid with an elbow fracture. And early on in my career, I get so excited that I could go in, put in plates and screws, and treat the athlete, get them back on the field. But slowly, I started to notice and realize that when I would see an x-ray like this, it really just meant I had more work to do. And that's where we talk about this idea of burnout. It's characterized by depersonalization, a decrease, um, or sorry, an increase in mental, physical, and emotional exhaustion, as well as a lack of self-efficacy. But when I was coming up in my training, when I heard this term, I used to think that, you know, that person was just weak, or they couldn't hack it in surgery. But now I realize that burnout, although it manifests in individuals, is a systemic, organizational problem. It's an occupational hazard. Just like when I'm in the operating room, if I cut my hand with a saw or stab myself with a scalpel, that too is an occupational hazard. And we know over the past decades, there have been reams of literature and research done that talk about the impact on the individual, but also on the patients and the healthcare ecosystem. And as you can see here, personal issues that result from burnout include broken relationships, alcohol and substance abuse, mental health issues, and even suicide. There's about four to 500 physicians every year that take their own lives for various reasons. But the flip side of this coin is the professional and financial ramifications of burnout. We know that burnout is associated with decreased quality of care, increased medical errors, decreased patient satisfaction, decreased productivity and professional effort, and physician turnover. You can imagine it costs about $500,000 to a million dollars to replace one physician that leaves most health systems and organizations in this country. But what's really costly is the physicians that are experiencing burnout, experiencing burnout, excuse me, they're suffering from depersonalization and negativity and cynicism, 
that don't leave. They show up to work every single day, sometimes for decades, spreading that cynicism and negativity to all members of the clinical team, but most importantly to the patients they're taking care of. So interventions to address burnout, we know you're going to get the most bang for your buck at the organizational and system level. Far too often we put the onus on individuals to take care of themselves and do things to help mitigate the signs and symptoms of burnout, which is helpful and we do need to take some ownership as individuals, but ultimately it's the system's responsibility. So where do you begin? You look at this picture up here, it's a cluttered old attic or basement. And if I tell you to clean that up, you go in, you look at it, you see the dust and the mold, you kind of freak out, you shut the door, and you just put it off to the side. That's what a lot of us physicians deal with. The amount of inertia and energy and time and resources that I have to expend, or any physician has to expend, to improve their little local work environment is tremendous. A lot of us don't know where to go, what to do. All we know is just roll up our sleeves and keep going to work. Well-being is a lot more than just a lot of the individual interventions you see here. Yoga, mindfulness, meditation, exercise, going to the doctor yourself, getting enough rest. These are all important things. But we know from a lot of the research that's been done, specifically the Stanford Well MD model of professional fulfillment, that it's a huge interplay of some of those intervention, individual interventions, along with a culture of wellness. That's talent development, teaching self-compassion, personal growth and professional development, along with this idea of efficiency of practice. It's not just about the work that we do. It's about how we do the work. We have to do streamlined work, automated work when applicable, removing the pebbles in the shoe and the thorns in our side of all the things that just get in the way of us just trying to do our jobs. The priorities we have to address burnout, on the top left you can see workload. Now, we're not lazy individuals in the healthcare industry, but we have to be doing an appropriate amount of work. But in addition to that, we have to do the appropriate kind of work, too. You can't do things that aren't commensurate with your license and skill set. On the top right, again, we focus on teamwork, professional development, personal growth, talent development. On the bottom right, you can see this idea and this notion of work-life integration. As I mentioned before, I'm an orthopedic surgeon, but that's not who I am. It's just what I do for a living and how I pay my bills and feed my children. I have to be in an environment and a system that allows me to be a normal, regular person, but also to do my job. And last but not least, the main priority is meaning and work. We know that when you spend at least 20% of your time doing something that's particularly meaningful for you, that that's highly protective against burnout. At our organization at Nemours, I'm the direct director of clinician well-being, and I'm fortunate enough to spend a day, maybe a day and a half a week, doing something that's particularly meaningful for me. It allows me to connect to the other physicians and doctors and staff in our hospital. It doesn't necessarily cause direct revenue to come into the hospital, but it causes indirect revenue by helping other people take care of their patients. So how do we set people up for success? I want to give a little analogy. If you see this toolbox that you can get for $30, $40, probably from Lowe's or Home Depot, and I ask you to build this huge mansion, you're probably going to look at me like I'm crazy. You're never going to have the amount of tools and resources that you need to do something like that. That's kind of an analogy that's akin to a lot of what us physicians go through. As I mentioned, we do a lot of training. I spent 15 years of training after high school to get my first job here at Nemours. And there are certain things that I actually was never taught that are really helpful to my job. Number one is leadership. As she mentioned before, I'm the chief of the sports medicine surgery service at our hospital. I have to lead, mentor, advise, and guide other physicians, athletic trainers, physician assistants, medical assistants. I never had any formal training in leadership. I never knew that there were different types of leadership. I didn't know that there were different scenarios in which you would employ those different types of leadership. That can be very frustrating when you're in a position of leadership and you don't ultimately have the skills to do what you need to do. Then there's this notion of communication. 
even though I do surgery all day, I probably spend 98% of my time communicating with people, other doctors, patients, family members. Little did I know that I'm going to need to learn how to deliver bad news. I'm going to need to learn how to give feedback, receive feedback, do conflict resolution. These are all things that are very, very important to our jobs, but there's no amount of orthopedic anatomy that I'm going to know that's going to help me through these tough communication situations. Then there's this notion of emotional intelligence. As a surgeon and physicians and other healthcare workers that are in positions of leadership, the words that I say and the actions that I take have a profound effect on all of the people that are members of the clinical team around me. I have to learn how to motivate and inspire people, but I also have to be self-aware and know how to self-regulate and be empathetic. And again, these are key vital skills to my job that for whatever reason were just left out of all those long, arduous years of medical training. So I wanted to share with you all my vision for the future. And it stems from looking at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement's quadruple aim. It's very important to focus on population health, patient outcomes, patient experience, reducing costs, but it's also vital that when you're making decisions at a healthcare system level, organizational level, even at a private practice, that you take into consideration the well-being of the people that are doing the work and the provider satisfaction. I think we need to start early and often with our education of some of these more quote-unquote soft skills. We can't wait till somebody's full-fledged, a full-fledged physician and in their practice to start teaching them how to take care of themselves how to think about well-being, how to have skills to mitigate burnout. We have to start at not only the medical student level, but maybe even the pre-medical student level. A lot of hospitals are evaluated on things as how many surgeries they do, what kind of high-tech technology they have, how many patients they see. I think we should also hold hospitals accountable and have metrics in place so we measure them based on what kind of resources and interventions and policies do they have in place to take care of the people that are doing the work that make them money. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't have a shameless plug about my two boys, Josh and Jonah, my little brown bears. Don't tell them I told you that. And I wanted to give you an example of just a couple of days ago, my older son, Josh, said, hey, Dad, you know, my eighth grade class is going on a field trip. And, you know, I was hoping that you would be a chaperone for us. I was touched. I couldn't believe that he asked me that. And luckily for me, I have some administ extra administrative time where I can move meetings around because I do a lot of them on Teams and virtual. And I asked him, you know, what day I need to be there, what time, and, and, and what I need to do to prepare. And he told me everything. I think it's going to work. But three, four, five years ago, I would never be able to do this. And I think the key that I'm trying to demonstrate here is that our physicians and our other healthcare providers, we need the flexibility and the autonomy to be able to provide value to our organizations and to our patients in a way that doesn't affect our personal lives. And I'm lucky and I'm blessed that I'm able to do that. But not all physicians are able to do that, and a lot of healthcare workers as well. So I'd like to leave you today with a few salient points to take home with you. Always remember that burnout is an occupational hazard. It manifests in individuals, but it's deep-rooted at the organization and systems level. You would never send somebody to work at a construction site without a hard hat, without goggles, without ear protection, without heavy boots and heavy jeans to wear to protect them. It's the same exact thing. If people are going to work in a chaotic, complex healthcare system that we're all existing in, we need, as a system and as a society, to prepare and um, arm people with the tools that they need to not just to survive, but to thrive, grow, and develop in their jobs. Physicians and other healthcare workers need to be engaged, fulfilled, and be able to find joy and meaning in the work that they do. That they do. Always remember that although an individual may be experiencing symptoms of burnout, the ramifications are not just for them it is much more far-reaching to the organization that they work in, but most importantly, the patients that they take care of. 
And patient care, patient outcomes, and their experience are all intertwined and affected by the burnout symptoms that people may be feeling. And always remember this conundrum. If the people that are doing the frontline work aren't fulfilled, aren't optimized, aren't feeling joy and satisfaction in the work that they do, but more importantly, aren't taught to take care of themselves, how could we possibly expect them to provide appropriate, high quality care to the patients that they're treating? Thank you. Thank you.